that in fact was the hymn that I was thinking about last week that I couldn't quite remember the title of um, when I was uh, in the message last week. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans chapter 6. Uh, we'll finish up this chapter uh, today. Uh, Romans chapter 6, I will read uh, you know, verses 15 to the end of the chapter, but we will focus in on verses 20 to 23. And some of those verses I hope are familiar. As we've been singing here, uh, I notice the progression um, from the uh, uh, choir who sang about sitting at the feet of Jesus. And we sang about that, and then our course was to turn our eyes upon Jesus. So if you're sitting at the feet of Jesus, you naturally would want to turn your eyes upon him. And then Tammy's song, Here's My Prayer. Take me, take my all, let my life be consecrated. And I thought that was, none of this was, you know, planned ahead of time. This is what God sometimes does. He organizes things, and I thought that a uh, very neat um, coming together of that. Um, but uh, we will look at uh, Romans 6, uh, verses 20 to 23. Um, let me read from verses 15 and onward. Uh, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that though that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin have, born, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word this morning, and we thank you for its life-transforming power through your Holy Spirit. And I ask you, Lord, to fill me with your Holy Spirit and speak through me to our hearts this morning. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from be. And so, Lord, may you speak to our hearts, and may you bring that encouragement that we need today to press on, to press on in a world that looks to us, that has gone very far away from you, and to press on to know you, to know your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, many Americans, especially city dwellers, are probably ignorant of the process of growing fruit. Uh, they might know that it comes from a tree, but they do not realize the time and energy that it takes to plant and cultivate and reap the fruit that it, uh, from a tree. Now, there are some among us, even today, that have or have had fruit trees in the past. And so you immediately know the process of planting them, of growing them, them, of tending them, and of reaping the fruit from the trees. We all know, I think, that fruit does not grow overnight. It's not something that happens in a moment. Uh, we, know, uh, we know this. It takes years before a fruit tree actually matures so that it can bear fruit. Even when it does, it takes an entire season for the buds to turn to blossoms, the blossoms to form into tiny little fruits, and the fruit to grow and ripen in the sunshine. Only then are we able to pick the fruit from the tree and crunch into an apple or taste the sweetness of a juicy pear. 
Now the Bible uses, often uses imagery of fruit to describe our lives or some aspect of the kingdom of God. As the physical fruit trees take time to bear fruit, so also our lives take time to mature and bear fruit. Whether or not the fruit tree gets plenty of sunshine and water or not will actually affect the fruit. Whether it is planted in good soil or poor soil makes a difference to how the fruit is going to come out. The same is true with our spiritual lives. What is in us will eventually come out of us. What we continue to focus on will continue to form us. For instance, Jesus said in Matthew 12:33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Every tree is known by its fruit, and every person is known by the fruit that they produce. I'm not saying that we are trees that bear apples and oranges or bananas. What I am saying is that it is the fruit of a person's life. What is coming out of that person's life? The words that are coming out, whether they are harsh or gentle, whether uh, love comes out or hate comes out, that is what I am meaning by that. And here in Romans, there are two different kinds of fruit and two different kinds of destinies. And we will pick two different types of fruit and explore its origin, its taste and its end. And so let us first see the fruit of sin. We read in verses 20 to 21, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. The fruit of sin begins with slavery to sin. This fruit grows in the soil of sin by the polluted waters of wickedness. Just like a tree cannot move from its place, so we cannot move ourselves from our sin from sin. The Apostle has already mentioned the concept of slavery to sin in this letter. Last week we learned that uh, we are slaves to someone or something. No one is entirely free. We are either slaves to sin or slaves to God. There is no straddling the fence, no neutrality, no in-between. In the words of the rock star Bob Dylan, we're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but we're going to have to serve somebody. We also learn that the test of our obedience proves whom we do actually serve. A tree is known by its fruit, a woman by her actions, a man by his deeds. What we obey proves to be our master. Our obedience will display our allegiance, whether it is to sin or whether it is to God. Now, every Christian was once a slave to sin. Everyone who is not a Christian is currently a slave to sin. Now, I hardly need to mention this today, as we see it all around us, and we know the pool of sin in our own lives. Those of us who have become Christians later in life will look back on our lives and remember those feelings of hopelessness and hopelessness that we've had in regard to our sin. We might, about, we might have thought about changing the way uh, we lived and perhaps even made some resolves to do so, but they were futile and fruitless to do so. Our resolve was of no avail against the reign of sin in our lives. We might have wanted to stop yelling at our children or spouse, but we had no power to stop that. We might want to have wanted to stop gossiping about our neighbors, but we were powerless to do so. We were slaves of sin. We were in bondage to it. We obeyed it because we could not help but to do so. We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 2. We were powerless to change. We were slaves to sin. In this regard, we were free from righteousness. We had nothing to do with righteousness. God was an, was an afterthought at best, or no thought at all in our lives. Righteousness held no sway over our lives. We looked at God's righteous laws, and we thought them restrictive. We thought them a prison house instead of the freedom that they actually do bring us. How many times does a non-Christian think, that God's laws forbid fun. 
How many times have we might have thought that as well before we became a Christian? Sometimes people think that God is a killjoy. He wants to squash all the fun out of life. If I obey him, then I'll have a morose, boring life. That's what the world thinks. That's what non-Christians think. He or she is free from righteousness and has no desire to submit to it. The fruit of sin has its origin in the soil of slavery to sin. We obey its passions, lusts, and desires, and as we do so, the bud of sin blossoms, the tiny fruit comes, and then it grows and matures. The more we obey sin and its desires, the more the fruit of sin matures in our lives. Again, we must remember that the Christian was once like that. We had to obey. We were a slave to sin. Yet the Apostle Paul reminded the Christians in Rome, and we are reminded today that we have died to sin, that Christ has set us free, that the body of sin is nullified within us. Therefore, the Apostle challenges us, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. The fruit of sin begins with slavery to sin. Now let us see that the fruit of sin is shameful. As we read in verse 21, the apostle says, But what fruit were you getting at the time uh, from the things of which you are now ashamed? Again, we remember that he is talking to Christians in this passage. And he reminds them of the fruit of sin in their lives in the past. What fruit did you have when you served sin? What outcome did you have? When we sow the seed of sin, we reap the bitter fruit of shame. Sin appears on the outside as something beautiful and something pleasurable. But any and all who have tasted that fruit know that it is poisonous and that it leads to shame. We become full of shame, guilt, and regret. Words we spoke in anger, jealousy, or pride come back to haunt us, and we feel the distance between spouses, children, or friends. Sinful actions, once done, have a way of haunting us in the days to come. Even the hookup culture and the rampant sexual immorality among teens and college students leaves them high and dry. Author Nancy Piercy, in her book Love Thy Body, writes, Students have to work hard to disassociate their feelings with their sexual encounters. They feel hurt and alone. Alone. They have regret. They have shame. All sin will bring shame into your life. We can never just sin and think nothing of it. We can never think that we will not reap the fruit of our actions and our deeds. And then when a person becomes a Christian, they realize the sin that they have committed in the wasted, shameful moments of the past. When we are slaves of sin, we may deposit toward this, and we in time reap shameful fruit. And when we look back at those moments, do we not have shame in our lives? That was something shameful. And the only way to get rid of that is coming to the cross and seeing Christ and Him crucified. He takes our sin, our guilt, our shame upon Himself. There are sometimes uh, stains on our consciences whenever we walk down memory lane. But I tell you the truth today that Jesus Christ is able to cleanse us from our sin. is able to wash those stains away from us by His blood that He shed on the cross. So that when they come back, those shameful things that we have thought of, when we think of them, we know that we are forgiven. And as we will learn later in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. While the fruit of sin begins with slavery to sin, and we reap its shameful fruit, but it results, but the fruit of sin results in death. For the end of those things is death, the Apostle Paul writes. Sin leads to death. Sin may take you to pleasure-filled valleys, but the precipice of death is right there, waiting to snatch you and cast you off. Sin leads to death. This echoes what the Lord told Adam at the very beginning, that, hey, if you take this forbidden fruit 
from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day that you eat it, Adam, you will surely die. And that echoes in our hearts today. Sin incurs the judgment of God, and the penalty of sin is death. What is this death? Well, context suggests that it is actually physical death. Romans 1.32, though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give their approval to those who practice them. Romans 5.12, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. There is an aspect of physical death here in context, and here in the book of Romans, but... As one commentator noted, that since it is parallel eternal life, we cannot, we cannot miss or escape the fact that it probably deals with the eternal death as well. Sin is a dead end alleyway that only leads to hell. Whenever people tell you otherwise, whenever they tell you, oh, go experience this, oh, go and sin, it won't hurt. Do not believe them because it leads to a dead end street. It will kill you. Sin leaves you empty, devoid of meaning, and ultimately leads to death. Such is the fruit of sin. It begins with the slavery of sin. Its taste is shameful, and it leads to death. So why, why even go there anymore? Well, that's the fruit of sin. Now let us look at the fruit of grace. We read in verse 22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Let us first see that the fruit of grace begins with slavery to God. We were once slaves of sin, but now, because of Christ, we are slaves to God. Just as we were once free from righteousness when we were slaves to sin, now we are free from sin when we become slaves to God. And again, I remind you that this is through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is through his death and resurrection that he has set us free from sin and death. We are united with him. Sin is no longer our master. We no longer need to serve it anymore. God has freed us from it. We might shrink back at the thought of being a slave to God. If we do, then it only serves to remind us that long ago our first parents shirked at God's rule on their lives. They desired to be their own master and look where it has led them. This has been passed down to us. Yet before we shrink back or shirk from this, let us consider God as our Lord and master. He is a good and kind master. Now, if you have ever watched or read uh, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, there is a scene um, where one of Mr. Darcy's servants boasts in her master, and she says, he is the best landlord and the best master that ever lived. Not like the wild young men nowadays who think not, nothing but themselves. There is not one of his tenants or servants but will give him a good name. God is the best master whom we could ever serve. Others might think of God as a cruel and mean master, but they do not know him. His kindness and his goodness extends even to the unrighteous and the wicked when he sends the rain and the sun on them. Yet to those who belong to him, why, he has an everlasting love for them. Those who belong to Christ, he loves them as his dear own son. He remains faithful to us, even when we stumble and fall. He forgives us of our trespasses and our sins. He is generous to us and gives us things. This is our God. This is the one whom we serve. He is the best master ever, and one day, when we finally reach the shores of heaven, he himself will serve us as well. We are slaves to God. Better be the slave of God than to be king of the world. Better be in his service than the service of any other king, emperor, emperor, millionaire, or movie star. Better to receive his reward than all the wealth of this world. 
This is the beginning of the fruit of grace. God's grace brings us into relationship with Him. His grace begins our service with Him. His grace binds us to Christ so that we are slaves of God. His grace empowers us to serve Him. The fruit of grace begins with slavery to God. And so we have seen this fruit of grace, and it begins with our slavery to God. Now, uh, what, let us see what it consists of. It consists of sanctification. What de- then, if we tasted this fruit in someone's life, what does it taste like? It tastes like holiness. It tastes like sanctification. And as a divine flavor on it, if you will, the fruit you get leads to sanctification. Well, what is sanctification? This is a, a word that sometimes you uh, encounter through the New Testament. It's a, it's a larger word, and you might not know it. You might, um, but it, it, it takes, uh, let's take a little bit of time to think about this a, a moment. Um, some versions translate it as holiness, um, and it is vital to our Christian growth and our eternal destiny. These two words, sanctification and holiness, come from one word in the original, and it simply means to be holy. Well, what is that? What does that mean? To be holy is to be set apart or consecrated to God. Uh, Sometimes the word holy describes the articles in the tabernacle or temple. Sometimes it describes the priest. God tells us people, be holy as I am holy. To be separate, set apart. Jerry Bridges defines holiness in his book, The Pursuit of Holiness, as to be separated from sin and therefore consecrated to God. J.I. Packer in his book, Rediscovering Holiness, writes, Holy in both biblical languages means separated and set apart for God, consecrated and made over to Him. In its application to people, the word implies both devotion and assimilation. Devotion in the sense of living a life of service to God, assimilation in the sense of imitating, conforming to, and becoming like the God one serves. Sanctification or holiness is a separation onto God. Thus, all Christians, and get this, all Christians are called saints, which means holy ones, or set apart. Now, this is amazing. Like, we we think of those saints as those heroes of old, those men and women of old who did amazing things, when in reality, we are all saints. So, when you greet somebody after the service, say, hey, saint, Hey, St. Ron, hey, St. Cliff, say, say their names, and because that's what we are in Christ. <clears throat> Christ is the source of our sanctification, as we read in 1 Corinthians 1.30. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. J.C. Riley, who lived during the 19th century, wrote that faith in Christ is the root of all holiness, that the first step toward a holy life is to believe on Christ, that union with Christ by faith is the secret of both beginning to be holy and continuing holy. Apart from Christ, we will not be holy. There's no way we can be holy. There's no way at all. But Christ is the source of our sanctification. He's the source of our holiness. Sanctification is also the will of God for our lives. We find this in 1 Thessalonians 4.3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4.7. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. And there is no wiggle room here. God calls us to a holy life. <clears throat> we, um, as Christians, live in the already not yet time. It's in one way we are already holy in Christ, and in another way there is a process, sanctification, the process of becoming more like Christ, more like God. Again, J.C. Riley is helpful when he writes, true holiness does not consist merely of believing or feeling, but of doing and bearing, and a practical exhibition of active and passive grace. Now, we cannot simply ask God to make us holy and then sit down in front of the television or watch Netflix or surf the internet for hours on end and get up and think, oh, why am I not holy? Why didn't God answer my prayers? 
Well, that's spiritual laziness. God calls us to sanctification. He calls us to pursue it. He calls us to pursue Him. Grace calls, calls us and teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to say yes to an upright and godly life in Christ. Grace calls us both to rest in Christ's holiness as our own and to strive after and pursue holiness in Him. There is no such thing as a stagnant Christian. Either we are pursuing God or we are not. Either we are being more conformed to Him or we are not. There is no, no wiggle room in that. Now the fruit of grace begins with, <clears throat> with our slavery to God and consists in our sanctification and holiness. The result of the fruit of grace is eternal life. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. We ought to note here that sanctification or holiness leads to its end, to eternal life. This does not mean that we earn our way to eternal life through holiness. Rather, grace makes us holy and gives us the desire to pursue holiness in our everyday lives. Holiness and eternal life are both gifts of God's grace and fruits from our life. Now, the end of sanctification is eternal life. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we often hear about eternal life, but we might do well to clarify what exactly is eternal life. We might have this vague, ethereal view of it. Randy Alcorn, in his book entitled Heaven, once had a pastor confess to him that he was not looking forward to heaven. When asked why, now this is a pastor of a church, the pastor said, I can't stand the thought of that endless tedium to float around in the clouds with nothing to do but strum a harp. It's all so terribly boring. Now, if this is all that we look forward to, is it any wonder that no, none of us pursue eternal life with vigor? None of us are like in John Bunyan's book, The Pilgrim's Progress. There is a scene where someone is battling his way into the, the, this, this kingdom of God. He expected the scars, he expected the wounds, but he knew what lied before him. Is it any wonder that nobody cries out eternal life, eternal life, and runs? Yet if it's just simply floating around on clouds, what hope is that? Oh, brothers and sisters in Christ, heed not the voices of the world that portray heaven as dead and boring. Do not listen to Satan's lies that tell you eternal life is merely endless tedium. No, God paints vivid pictures of the new heavens and the new earth. Eternal life as portrayed in his word. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher of the 19th century, said of eternal life, yes, and when we get to heaven and the eternal life shall, be, shall there be developed as a bud opens into a full-blown rose, when our life shall embrace God's life and God's life shall encompass ours, when we shall be abundantly alive to everything that is holy, divine, heavenly, blessed, and eternally glorious, oh, then we shall confess that our life was all of the grace of God, the free gift of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, let's pause for a moment and think about eternal life for a while. First, let us remember that eternal life begins here and now with knowing God. Jesus prayed in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is to know God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you know Him? Do you enjoy Him? Consider this, our God is infinite. He is eternal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And all-knowing, we have eternity to learn more about our God. Imagine sitting with the one who knows everything and sipping your coffee while he tells you about himself, about the world, about yourself. Imagine that. Or furthermore, our God is everlasting in his love. Now it's always great when you can sit down and you can talk to somebody you know loves you unconditionally. No matter what you share with them, they are going to love you. 
no matter what. Imagine having a cup of coffee with God and sitting there with the one who knew you from the day before you were born, who, who knew everything about you, who knows all the times that we have failed, stumbled, fallen, sinned, and yet has sent his one and only son to die for you, to purchase you from among the nations. And he loves you with an everlasting love. This is eternal life, to know this one, to know this God of ours. And do you know him? That is a question that you have to ask yourself. Do you know him through his son, Jesus Christ? Another aspect of God that I don't know if you thought about, but God is joyful. Like when Jesus tells the parable of the talents, he said, the master tells his servants that are good. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness, or come and share the joy of your master. Enter into the joy of your master. You know, when we arrive on those golden shores one day, we are going to experience in full the joy of God. Second, let us remember that eternal life consists of our resurrected bodies. On the day the Lord Jesus returns, this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. We know that when the last trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Those who have died in the Lord will be raised again. And we who remain will be changed. And we will have our resurrected bodies. No more aches and pains of old age. No more cancer. No more sicknesses. No more diseases. No more dimness of eyes or hard of hearing. Wow, I'm going to run and jump and leap and sing and shout for joy. And in all this when he comes for his home. Third, we also must remember that eternal life ultimately consists of the new heavens and the new earth. As 2 Peter 3.13 tells us, But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We catch a glimpse of what eternal life is like. Like it's not just floating on a cloud, some ethereal thing. Mountains and seas, valleys and rivers, the lush forests, the wildlife, the things that we see here and love, those are foretastes of what glory is going to be like in that day. I don't know what kind of work we will have, but I assure you that we will have meaningful things to do there. It is going to be a place where we will have a great reunion with God and with the saints who have gone before us, and we will, we will be together forever. I guarantee you, you will not get bored there. So don't believe that lie. And, and, and one other thing the Bible often talks about, uh, sitting down with Abraham and Isaac and Israel and eating. So there's going to be food there too. So we have seen the fruit of grace and the fruit of, of sin. Now let us briefly see the contrast between sin and grace. For this, I hope, I'm going to read the very familiar verse. Um, I hope it's familiar to you. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin, as we learn, leads to death. Its wages, its pay is death. This is what it's, it is. This word wages means a, a soldier's rations. So when you serve sin, you get death, an eternal death. However, the contrast of this is grace, but the gift, the free gift of God is eternal life. God in His grace gives us a gift of eternal life. We do not need to earn it. We do not need to pay for it. It is given to us. Just as many of us give our children or grandchildren presents around their birthdays or Christmas, so God gives us this gift. 
Is this not grace? Sin pays us with death, but God gives us eternal life. Now there is a very important note that I must end on. This free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We cannot merely think that we can earn eternal life. It is all through Jesus Christ our Lord. His coming into the world, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, the Bible says. His life earned us righteousness. His death secured salvation for us. His resurrection proved that He was who He is, and He came to do what He came to do, to die for His people, that they might be free. He, and He alone, is the one we look to when we feel shame and guilt and remorse. Look to His death. He has paid that price. He has forgiven us. When you feel weak and weary in your Christian walk, look to His resurrection. Know His resurrection power. If you are afraid of death, you need not be if you are a Christian. Christ has risen, and so will you. Here then we encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. What have you done with him? Have you come to him broken and repentant, telling him that you cannot save yourself? Come to him as a slave of sin and say, Dear Lord, I have mercy on me. I, can't, I cannot escape. I'm polluted. I cannot get clean. Sin is a cruel master and has beaten me and my wounds fester. Sin will one day pay me the due reward, which is death. Only you can help me. And here he is, here he is, who comes and breaks the chain of sin. Here he is, who washes you free from sin. Here he is, who, who does not pay you in death, but gives you life instead. Do you know him? Believe in him, and you will have everlasting life. And brother and sister in Christ, this message is just for us as those who do not know our Lord Jesus. Consider your past when you think about your past and feel that shame, then go to Him. Look to Christ and Him crucified to wash away your sin. Set aside some time to think about your life and how you are progressing in holiness. Ask Him to make you holy. Are you relying on Christ to refine you and progress you in sanctification? Set aside some time and think about eternal life. Think about what it will be like and the glory that will be that you will know God, you will see Him face to face, that you will have your resurrected bodies, that we will be in the new heavens and the new earth, and there's so much more as well. That's just a glimpse this morning. And let that, pers let that spur you on to pursue eternal life in Christ. May you be like John Bunyan's character, Christian, who when he heard about the gospel, he closed his ears and ran away from the city of destruction saying, eternal life, eternal life, eternal life. He didn't want to hear the voices pulling him back. May we be like that in our pursuit of that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the grace that you have given to us. And may we set our hearts to pursue you and you alone. Amen. If you have your hymn books, please turn to uh, hymn number 324, the word I have hidden in my heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm.